Uh, my name is Patricia Falcão, and I'm a conservator at Tate. Um, oh, I also need this. Uh, I think I must be very clear to start with. I'm, I'm a conservator, and I trained as a conservator for furniture to start with, and now I ended up here. I, I, I've learned to read code because a little bit because I needed to. I'm not a programmer, and I'm not a software developer, so it's not a requirement. <laughs> and I always have this little bit of the, um, what's the, there's this, where you always feel that you don't know enough, and now I've, over the ti time I've learned, actually, I don't know programming, but I do know quite a lot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I hope you, you yeah. I'm waffling now. Uh, so, as I said, I'm a time-based media conservator. And at Tate, we have a, a very large conservation department. I think there's about 50 people between conservators and technicians that deal with all the different media, so from paintings and sculpture to paper. Um, and we've had a section dedicated to time-based media, which we define as film, anything that has the aspect of time. So film and video, uh, software, performance, if there's people involved, um, and then life, light boxes for historical reasons. Uh, and so the team I work in is, is probably one of the largest time-based media conservation teams in the world. And we're one of the earliest departments. So we've had somebody looking specifically at this subject since 1998. And we've had a section, a separate section for this for a long time as well. So what you're seeing here is sort of this distillation of our processes over time and going from fairly simple objects to fairly complex. So it's not, I don't think it's an easy process. And when I came to it, it was already halfway. So this is the result of a lot of people, people's work. Um, and so, as I said, I'm also in Tate, which is this very specific institution. And because I've been there very long, I also have a very narrow view of the context. So if, um, if yeah, let's say it, it's, it's this whole context is fairly narrow. So it, it's worth questioning it if you have any, any questions. Um, I think what's important for me is that it's actually on Tate's mission, so this is what the government approved back in the 70s, I think, was that w this is what we need to achieve, and this is to care for, preserve, and add to the works of art in our collection and the archive, and I only work with our art collection. The ar uh, there is the archive as well, who also has their own digital challenges, um, but they're a separate section. Um, and the other thing that is really important is that we need to ensure that our works of art are exhibited. And for a painting or a sculpture, this is obviously, you know exactly what's gonna happen. And with time-based media works, the fact that you have to exhibit something means that you have to do more than just put it in the gallery usually. Uh, what this means, because it's here, is that I also have quite a lot of leverage in asking for resources and justifying the time that we need to research things. Uh, just to give you an, a sense of our collection, um, this th illustrates the whole of the Tate collection. There's about 80,000 entries, but I believe this blue, dark blue is just uh, uh, William Turner's work, painting and sketches. <laughs> Every single page of uh, Turner's work has one number, so that's how they show up in the collection. This is everything else. <laughs> and the yellow is time-based media. So all the film and video and, and everything, digital basically. And then what you don't see is like, there's this little sort of s slightly wider black line, <laughs> and that's the software-based artworks. And that line represents this. And there's a few, there's three more works that are in the process of coming in um, that are not listed here. But this is the whole collection. So what this means is that, oops, sorry. My exp you can see a few things. You can see the first work was acquired in 2003 and was also produced in 2003. In terms of software-based art, this is fairly 
late. I mean, it's using Windows XP. So looking at the people that I see in this room, you probably all worked with Windows XP, right? At, at some point. Maybe some of you haven't, but... <laughs> um, and then you can see most of them were bought shortly after they were produced, with a little exception. Um, and also, it, there's like one every other year or so, until 2015. And then in 2015, we had a, or 16, we had a change in the director at State Modern. And she said, well, we're going to start investing in digital art, which means software-based art, basically. Um, and so what we are seeing now as a result of that de decisions in policy is that the, the number of wor works that we are acquiring has increased. And so right now, I'm working on three artworks that use software as a medium. And that means a lot more resource. So, and this is not going to become less. We're going to have more and more works, more and more complex works, basically. So we need to step up what we've been doing. Uh, so this is the becoming the earliest work in the collection. It's by Michael Craig Martin, who is actually, I think he started as a graphic designer, and his work is a lot about drawing. And what he did is he worked with the developer to create this animation. And the, the software element is basically just creating some randomness in how these images appear and disappear. So you can see this one is becoming transparent. And then with time, some will appear and disappear. Um, and it, it's meant to hang in the gallery just like a painting. So you could, you could have it in the gallery next to his drawings, for instance. This is, for a long time, was the most complex work in the collection, and now it's not anymore. Um, it's an interactive installation by Rafael Zano Hammer called Subtitle Public. Um, and what happens is you go into a space, a dark space, and there's nothing there other than other visitors. Uh, and you have a word projected on you that says eats or sleeps, something that also works as an identifier. Um, and then you, it follows you through the space. And you, if you don't like the word, you want to get rid of it. And if you come close to somebody else, then you swap words with that person, in theory. Uh, it has 50% chance that that happens, actually, looking at the software. But So the theory is you swap words with the other person. Patricia, I, I, I realize I haven't mentioned about the Q&A. Oh, okay. um, um, when we discuss, it could be an intera interactive presentation. So if you have any yeah. questions, please address. Oh, sorry. Yes, I meant to say that. But, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, so what this, what did I say? Yes. So it sort of lets you, that's what it does. It follows you in the space, and you're meant to swap words. This is fairly complex in that it uses a network of computers and cameras and projectors that need to talk to each other. You need to track the space. You need to find where people are in the room. So it is fairly involved not just the software itself, but also how you install it and um, the um, calibration process to make it run correctly. Uh, and this is another piece by Jose Carlos Martinat, who's a Peruvian artist, uh, called Brutalismo. And it's actually based around this sculpture is a model of the Pentagonito, which was the headquarters of the political police in Peru, I think. Um, and the work was also firstly shown on this brutalist gallery in Brazil, the Galeria Leme, which is in this brutalist building. So what do the software is doing is, if you see, there's this computer here, and it's searching the internet for words around brutalismo as an architectural term, but also related to dicta dictatorship and, and political violence and all sorts of, and, and then it actually is looking just brutalismo and, and related terms. And it was very much looking at South America, and then we brought it to London. And I'm, I'm Portuguese, so the words that we're searching for in, in Spanish, so brutalismo is the same as Portuguese, and so when we started testing it, we started seeing results about Portugal and Portuguese dictatorship. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm meant to have this, this influence on, on the artwork that it's just talking. And so we talked to, to 
Jose Carlos and said, well, you know, it's going to be in Britain, so the results will be different. And it's Google, so we don't really have much say on that. And, and he was like, oh, no, it's fine. It should move with the times. And if you get different results, that's, that's fine. But that was sort of a moment where I was like, oh, I'm actually influenced something that I can't not influence almost. Um, and, so, oh, the, and so, oh, that's not what I meant to do. So you, do, you have this computer, and then it sends sentences to these printers. And so you have sentences related to the search terms coming out in these little pieces of paper. Uh, and so when I first started looking at software-based art preservation and thinking, you know, it was in 2008 for my May thesis, and this was sort of what I came, why do we feel that this is such a, a different subject or problem? Um, and I think the one point is that these systems are bespoke. So for the works that you saw on that list, we have probably, f I think we have four different operating systems and six different languages, uh, plus lots of different uh, proprietary software that is used as well in combination with that. And so each one of them is pretty much unique. Some of them might have the same infrastructure. So they, let's say there's two running on Windows XP, uh, but they are bespoke. Uh, also, the other point is you can really change them very easily. Very often what you see as a conservator installing a work in, in the museum is that you come in and the artist comes in and his technician who developed the software comes in and all of a sudden, they've changed things. They made it all better, which is, you know, it's just a process that it is, but you need to be aware of that. And at first that made me sort of quite nervous because things were being changed and you're not meant to change things in, in the museum. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, you know, that's just part of the process and you just um, understand the changes that are being made and document those, but it's fine to let other people change. Um, and so again, with the change, the, the thing, technological environment is changing. So I don't think anybody here will still be using Windows XP at home. So, <laughs> oh yes, you are, you are the example. <laughs> uh, or, but also, so the technology is changing, but also the, the tools and the possibilities for preservation are also changing. So I think there is a massive difference in what is possible now to what was possible um, 10 years ago. So what are we trying to preserve? And this is not as obvious, and I mean, it doesn't have as an obvious answer as you might think. So I'll just see, see, show you how I think about it. So I looked a lot into the digital preservation world, world because we are learning a lot from them. There's a, they, there's a massive community all over the world working on digital preservation and they've come very far in many subjects. So if you're starting, that's a good place to, to look. Um, and they have, they, they created this definition of significant properties, which is what you want to preserve. And this can be applied, for instance, for a spreadsheet. And if all you need is the content of that spreadsheet, as in the results that you see on the spreadsheet, then you can have you know, a static text file that recreates that. But if you want to know the calculations that are used to create the numbers on that spreadsheet, then you need to do something else. And for artworks, it's the same, but with another level of complexity. So what I did was I just stole their definition. And instead of saying digital assets, I say artworks. And what that does is explode outside of the digital world to the whole artwork, or at least that's what I hope it happens. Um, and the other point here is that you need to think, if you're thinking about digital preservation, you need to think about accessibility. So if you have a, a box in, in, you know, in, in the attic, it's not really accessible. And for us, accessibility is about putting stuff in the gallery and displaying it. Uh, and usability, so being able to, to use it and reuse it, and, and their meaning. Um, so this is sort of, it doesn't answer the question completely, but it just so you understand where, where I'm coming from. 
so these are the parameters I usually think about when, when I'm looking at an artwork for the first time. And so if you look, it usually starts with the media or the software or the data, uh, which comes you know, in, a, in a memory stick or, a, or, or on the computer somewhere. Um, you know, and you can usually like see it like on your computer. Uh, and that is sort of the core. But then you also need to think, okay, I'll need to play this back. And I use playback because I mostly work with video. I don't know if it would be the right term to talk about software, but it's the same idea, is that you need to, to be able to run the software as well. Um, and that's usually not very unique. So you, we use a lot of these little nuts, for instance, and, and we use them for everything. And, but then you also need to think about the display equipment. So is there a projector showing some images? Or is it a projector actually just so showing you words? Or is it just a printer? Is there a screen or a monitor? So this, what sort of equipment are we talking about? And then last but not least, you have the display space. And for many of our installations, you need to have a lot of other information to really understand what an artwork is. So in this case, this is a, a plan for an installation. And you know, you start, you have these files here, and in the end, they need to be displayed in the space like this. So you know that's you know the first vid the first projection is there, the second projection is there. The third projection is there. So it's, it's a lot of things that you need to bring together. And the other thing is, depending on your artwork, these conceptual elements can have different weights. So in some cases, all you need is your media. So if you have a video work, you have a video file, and it's meant to be shown in a monitor or projected, but you know what you need is to show the content of the video, and so really, what you need to preserve is this. But if you have something like a Namjoon Pike um, artwork, it can be that some of these aspects, specifically uh, the display space or the display equipment, have conceptual value, and in that case, you need to adapt your strategies to be able to accommodate that. And so this is sort of what I think when we first do an assessment of, a, of an artwork. Um, and the, that moment is, is here. So, so this is how we think about the life cycle of an artwork in the Tate collection. So the artworks are produced here, or sometimes there, depending <laughs> by the artist. Um, and by the time they come to us, they've usually been shown a few times, at least, in, in different environments. So there's this history before it gets to us. Um, and then Tate has a very strict procedure uh, about our process on how an artwork is, comes into the collection. So curators propose artworks. And then before the final agreement is given, uh, they contact us and we create this risk assessment process. And that is this acquisition moment. And at that stage, we do that risk assessment. We plan the preservation for the longer term. And, uh, and we create a series of, of report, uh, reports that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but so this is the overall aspect. So you, you start with an acquisition. Um, and then the work either goes into storage or it goes in on display. Uh, that's still not the most common. Uh, usually an artwork will come in and be stored for a couple of years and then is shown, just because of how um, exhibitions are planned with a few years interval. Um, and then eventually you, you may need to do an interve intervention of some sort into the object. So this will mean it's often before a display uh, or if we are aware of some problem. And a lot needs to happen, sometimes happens at the acquisition stage as well. So I'll just say a little bit more about this moment because it is a key moment. It's what uh, you were saying um, at lunch is 
actually, when you, s you need to have the information you need as early as possible. So if you know something is coming into your collection, that is the moment where you have the time to look at that. It's also, for us, it's a moment where we have a bit of pressure because what we do at Tate is we won't pay for an artwork until we have all the information and the media that we need. So that means that there is an incentive for the galleries and the artists to, to give us information we need because everybody's very, very busy and so sometimes it can be difficult to do that. Uh, so it usually starts with a few emails, just getting a sense. Actually, no, that's not how it starts. Sometimes it usually starts with a, a curator sending us an email saying, we're looking at this work, what do you think? And then usually, there may be a f PDF with some details about the work, but usually there's nowhere near enough information to give an assessment. And so we use Google, of course, and, and find images online and, and try to figure out what an artwork is. And actually, over time, we become very good at just looking at a couple of videos or images and sort of making an assessment of what... No, really, you know, you like... <laughs> Okay, there's a video, there's three videos, there might be sync or not, and there must, so there's speakers, so there's sound, and you look at it, so you, you can get, I, I joke that we're little detectives and trying, or stalkers, depending on the point of view. Um, and so we do a lot of guesswork first, and then eventually we go to the artist and, and start asking these questions that we need for, for our initial report. And what I found is you need to do your homework, because if you, I've, yeah, in, you, you can't go to an artist with a standard set of questions because they just get bored and then you don't get an answer. But if you come to somebody and you know what you look at, so you have precise questions that they can answer quickly, that's a much better chance of getting a good answer. So I totally not, do not recommend form, f you know, forms to be answered because it doesn't really work or you don't get the information you need. Um, so we, we ask questions about these three things. So we want to understand how an artwork is produced, what technologies are involved, who worked on it, you know, um, what uh, equipment is, is, is necess necessary, uh, and what they want to send us. So are they going to send us a computer with everything installed? Is it just an executable file on a USB stick? Uh, is there any source code included? Um, we want to understand that. And sometimes through this process, we understand ah, what they're giving us is actually not enough. And it's not a big deal if we ask for something else at this stage because they are getting all the data together. So if we ask now, we'll get what we need. Um, and so the third aspect are, these, are the display requirements, which is also important at this point because it helps us understand the equipment we may need. Um, and this is very informal. This is usually sort of four or five emails back and forth, depending on how complex the work is. Uh, and it is just a first step. So we then build on it as, as we receive the materials in-house. But the first step is just understanding what it is. Uh, so all of this is fed into this report that we fill out, which is, in fact, a risk assessment. And it's not very obvious here, but by doing this work, we are planning how we want to preserve it in the future, or at least what we need to do in the present so that we can preserve it in the future is actually the, the point. Uh, and also, very helpfully, it tells our curators and our budget holders how much money they're going to have to spend to preserve this work. Um, and then the other point is the result of the, the discussions about the display is that we create this document called display specification, which has all the information we need to display an artwork. Uh, and these are some of the examples, you know, these are things that we try to, to understand. Um, bearing in mind that for many of these works, these things might change oh, the next time a work is installed. So we try to create sort of a baseline of information knowing that it will change when the work is shown or if anything needs to be done to it. Um, and so this is what we are looking... This shouldn't be here. 
Oh, so at, at this point of acquisition, this is some of the things that we do for software. So we usually, we usually get one computer or two computers from the artist with everything installed and ready to run. I think that's because people usually prepare things to go into the gallery, so they want to have it set. And we assume that if it's on there, or, well, we don't assume actually because we test it, but the, the, the assumption is that the work is, is running as it's meant to run on that computer. Uh, and so the first step is just to create um, a backup, uh, not a backup actually, the first thing we now do is oh, it's to create the disk image of the original computer. And this was a fairly recent development that our, um, my colleague Tom Hansen has done a lot of work into how we want to do this because a disk image is basically a snapshot of that computer as is. So it, it contains all the information that is on the computer's hard drive. And you can correct me or explain in detail if you want. <laughs> but, uh, so that, that's sort of the first step. That means even if we can't access anything, we have that data. There's a few discussions on that uh, at the moment. We're using RAW. But there's also EWF, which is the expert witness format or something, that is also, it's, it's proprietary, so, but it has more metadata. And now I'm probably going to dip on the, the, the techie end. But, so th there's a few options uh, that are still in discussion, but raw seems to be uh, a, a safe option. Uh, so that's the first step. And then we do a series of, of copies. So we, we create another hardware copy. So we buy a new computer and reinstall all the software. What we find is that by doing that, we often find things that, you know, sort of, the, if the software uses a library and you don't have it, you won't have it on the computer that you've newly installed, so it, it will tell you that. Um, and just alert, the process of installing it means you learn more about the software and the system. It also means that you can have one computer in the gallery running, and if it breaks, you can replace it immediately, uh, which happens if you have a work running for 70 hours a week in the gallery. That's certainly going to happen. Um, so the other thing we've done is to start creating disk images from scratch. It's much cheaper than buying a computer, and, and um, you learn again, more about those dependencies that you need to care for. Um, actually, I, I, yeah. And I mean, libraries are pieces of software that are not necessarily in your operating system and are also not part of your, soft, of your artwork software, but that you still need it to run. So they, they, they would be on the disk image. They would be on the disk image, yeah. But not if you, if you are creating the new computer and you don't want to build it from the disk image. Then, you know, and then... Not from the disk image, no. We, we would install it from scratch. Uh, and, and also, we didn't... Oh, sorry. Okay. There's 10 minutes. <laughs> and so you then have copies, and then we keep copies of the operating systems and the executables and libraries that we want as digital objects. Uh, no, we don't, other than the extra computer, we don't keep any other, because in general they're not, you can move them on. So the fact that we create the, the, the hardware backup is more as a learning process and because we do need something to move into the gallery rather than thinking that that, that is relevant. You know, the, the, there is very little, I, in no, none of our works is the hardware essential. It's, they're all generic, so you can change it, um, with the exception of those printers that were shown, that we do have 20 of them in store. But uh, So this is how our disk imaging report looks like. And I'll just sweep through. 
And this is the sort of documentation that we create at acquisition. So the production history, technical specifications, so what are the hardware, the software, any specific dependencies that we are worried about, versions and updates. And this is quite important, actually. The function of the artwork is, is just a, a plain language description of what the software is meant to do. Because if you are looking at, um, at something running, you don't know necessarily what it's meant to be doing. Um, oh, and actually what is missing here is, as soon as we have a chance, we video what the software is doing. Because it's really hard, if you haven't seen something working, you can't really know what it's meant to be doing and if it's doing it correctly. Uh, so I'll just jump through these bits, I think, and go through to intervention. So storage, this is how our storage looks like and it's really essential. Um, you know, well, uh, sorry, this is not how our storage looks like, actually. <laughs> this is how our storage looks like for objects. That's where I keep our... Uh, and this is how we keep our media. So we still have... I mean, we keep all our videotapes and we have lots of hard drives that are st staying there in the... And this is sort of where I wish we were with our digital storage. <laughs> I think this may be a Google farm. It's not, it's not our servers. Certainly not our servers. Um, Yes, so that, that is a current project that has been much more painful than we thought it would be, is how to achieve uh, archival storage for digital things. And the point for me at the moment in an institution is to explain to an institution that you know, if you spend thousands and thousands of pounds on keeping your objects safely stored, you, know, you keep your paintings, nobody discusses that if you have the budget, you need to have a proper um, environmental conditions. Uh, you need to have your object well packaged because if you're going to ship it somewhere, you need to care for that. Um, and you need to know that your object isn't going to change in storage. You know, so, and keep track of that as well. And what is hard to explain to the museum that has been doing this for hundreds of years, or maybe not hundreds, but yeah, possibly hundreds some, um, is that for digital you need to do exactly the same. And it needs to be exactly the same level of care because our objects are digital, so you do need, you do need to have them safely stored. And you do need to have a good storage system. Um, and it needs to be packaged properly. And you need to know that it's not going to change in storage. So it's not that different. And it needs to be at the same level of infrastructure of an institution. But it's really difficult to make the case for this. Also because it's not necessarily the basic IT. So our, our IT team is really good, really busy. But they care for the whole of our uh, digital systems at Tate. So this is very little part of their work, and it needs its own set of, of <clears throat> skills. So if you I mean, if you have a small collection, then you might get away with a simpler system, but if you have a large collection, then you do need specific skills to care for that. Um, so, that, so that's what I meant to say, is digital storage is storage. Cultural objects, they need storage, <laughs> good quality. Um, and so moving on to the display, and this is something I very rarely do. We have very, I have very good colleagues at work on this. So other than saying that it is a moment where things change and you need to document that, uh, I'm just going to skip through. That's the, what our reports say about that. And now the intervention. And that's where things change a lot, usually. And like I said, it's mostly, it's often driven by displays. So if something is going on show, you may need to have, make sure your computers, original computers, are running. And you probably don't want to use a, an eight-year-old computer in the gallery. So you might need to move something on to the next computer. Um, so that will usually trigger changes. Um, and also, these interventions often ho happen at the acquisition moment. Um, OK, I think I can. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, I, th I sort of think of it as preventive intervention, which is when we first understand what an artwork is, we often have this discussion, 
with the artist about, okay, we know that if your work uses a printer that connects via these cables, RS-422, we will be in trouble to buy any printers that use this within the next 10 years. And so the conversation we had is maybe if you can also give us the option to run it from USB printers, that will give us a few more years. And this is a lot of guesswork, so I may be completely wrong, and maybe in 10 years you still have RS-422 <laughs> and not USB. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at least you're sort of spreading your risk into different options. Um, and for instance, we have another work that was done in this um, gaming development platform called Unity. And the artist gave us an executable that uh, runs on Mac OS. And then we had a conversation with him and he was like, oh yeah, it would be very easy to just export something uh, for um, Windows and Linux. And so he did that for us. So now instead of being dependent on this one piece, of, of, um, on this one operating system, we have an option of three. So in the future, we have a few more options on how to deal with this work. And then at the, at the other option is, or the other moment where you have an intervention is when something stops working. <clears throat> Or maybe before it happens. If um, and so this is then what happens before the display, very often. So one example was for the Lozano Hammer piece. We went, we shown it in 2009, and then we were showing it again uh, two years ago in one of his in his retrospective. And there was a really interesting conversation in that. We had been trying emulation in this really nice case study with Dragon and Klaus Reschert from the University of Freiburg, where we were using emulation, which was mean we were trying, we were running the original software in its original um, software environment, so its original operating system, but in in an emulator, so in a, in a completely different um, computer, uh, sorry, platform. Uh, and so we, we were like, well, can we use this simulation to show the work again? And then when we found out, we, we prepared it for the display, and we had a few options. So we could either move it just to new computers and maintain the original setup, which was what we did in the end because it was the simplest option, or we could run it on an emulator, or what the artist decided then to do afterwards, which was just moving the whole software completely to a new platform. Uh, so this is sort of a, a very bad summary of, of the <laughs> preservation <laughs> strategies that we use. But, you know, it, it's picking up just on, on the storage. And I, all, I tried, I, I can't find a way to, it's like interventions doesn't work. So th there's sort of two um, ways of addressing, uh, there's more, there's multiple ways. But so you can think about emulation, which is this option that I'll talk about. Um, and migration, and I have them as separate because there are different ways of intervening on things, but actually there's, I think in most cases you end up, or very often you end up having to, to use both in one way or another. So they're almost like different tools. If you're a, a paintings conservator, you, you wouldn't clean every single painting with the same solvent. You will choose which solvent is best for your work. So and this is a little bit the same process. And then, uh, it's documentation, again, it's, it's sort of the overarching thing because it's, it's, you need to understand what was done, but also because you are, it's so easy to change things, you also want to maintain, to, to at least have access to what was done originally and to understand how it has changed over time. Uh, and so these are the preservation actions that I was talking about. So we always start with the disk imaging, and then we try, we, we, we find emulation is, in many cases, the most sustainable option because it would allow you to preserve groups of works instead of individual works. Because you are thinking, I'm going to steal Dragon's words over lunch, you are just thinking of the operating systems rather than the individual works. Uh, but then in some, kind, some cases, you don't need to think about uh, migration and interacting more with with the software, the artwork software itself. 
and this is sort of an attempt at explaining a little bit better what emulation is. And so what you have here is, is the software environment. So this is what was on your computer when you first received it from the artist. So it will have your, your artwork software, but it will also have a, a, an operating system. And then it's talking to this virtual hardware environment, which is sort of, it's, it's lying to the, to the disk image to think that it is on, on, the, on the, the environment that it expects, that it's talking to the hardware that it expects. But it's not. So then you do have another a layer underneath uh, that cr that allows it to then talk to whichever computer you have underneath. This is a very simple explanation. Well, I'm trying to do a simple explanation, but um, maybe it didn't quite achieve that. And then this is sort of a, a, an illustration of uh, migration options. Um, so this is the work uh, becoming by by Michael Craig Martin or a representation. And so this is, the work was bought and existed as a computer. Um, there was a version made in 2003, and then again, another version in 2010, because the version from 2003 had bugs. Um, and so we created an, a new version. And at that point, we decided to use Flash. And now I'm kind of going like, that was not the best decision. <laughs> but it, I mean, at the time, it was sort of on the verge. We could have probably guessed it if, if um, but. And so you, what you see is that there are multiple versions and that we've moved. You know, So you have one monitor and another monitor um, and computer, and then the individual files for each one. And so I guess I'll just, oh, I'm over time, sorry. Um, so these are what we try to do to, to improve our practice. And this one is, we do have allocated time for research and we're very lucky that our research department has, has been involved in projects that meant we, we, they could give us time to do research and to find solutions. We are also training new staff. So we, our team has been increasing and we spend uh, quite a lot of time on training them. Uh, and we've started more and more working with other departments at Tate. So our technology department, curatorial and Tate Media, which is not, not the default. I, th I think we're quite unique like that in that we interact a lot more. But also, we've, we don't have the expertise in-house for most of the work. So we learn a lot from artists and their programmers, um, but also external soft, uh, the software developers and uh, computer scientists. We've uh, had a few collaborations with universities, so I was very excited to see Kamal here. I think it's a great thing to, to have a, a software developer, no, a computer engineer. <laughs> Scientist, sorry. Um, in in a, a conference like this. Um, and then again, I wouldn't, the digital preservation experts are excellent and it's a really nice community to learn from. And then of course we also work with other museums and universities and digital preservation community again. And this is what we're looking for in the future. So I don't think this will ever end. We'll always do that because things change. So every time, every few months there's new tools coming up and we want to learn about them and we started thinking that maybe we can contribute to those tools we haven't done a lot of that but seeing the example at rhizome for instance is okay we know what we need so uh, maybe we should ask for that and, and work with uh, developers to do that and and then work in our collaboration within and outside tate and so that was it. Thank you.